Sorry, when I first started putting notes together for this class, I thought that we would be able to cover the material in one class, but as I went along, I discovered that that's not the case. So we're going to have part one tonight and then part two, Lord willing, next week. All right, so the transfiguration, which was witnessed by the three, James, Peter, and John, as uh, was read for us in Luke chapter 9. And of course, we will look at it in the other gospel records as well. We'll try to blend them together to, uh, to get the full picture of, of what we're talking about. So essentially, um, a, start, a good starting place when you're approaching any of the parables or the miracles uh, that Jesus performed or gave is to consider first the the reason why what is the purpose so uh, we want to start with that what is the purpose for this which the three witnessed on the mount well we're told um, in verse 27 of luke chapter 9 that there be some standing here which will not taste of death until they see the kingdom of God. And so this gives us the, the context, if you will, for that which these men were about to see. What was it they were going to see? What was the, uh, the vision that would be given to them, the kingdom of God? Now, the word there that's used in Luke chapter 9, in verse 27, for the word see, till they see the kingdom of God, um, there are there are a number of different words in the Greek that are translated as see, um, essentially four. So this word here is, and you'll pardon my Greek pronunciations, is edo, uh, and it literally means to come to know or to understand. Okay, so what is Jesus saying? He's saying that there are some who shall not taste of death until they come to understand the kingdom of God. And that's the purpose for the vision. That's why Jesus brought them up into the mount, so that they might come to understand the kingdom of God. That word there doesn't, doesn't indicate seeing with the eyes. The second Greek word, uh, blepo or blebo. Now this is the opposite of being blind. The emphasis when this word is used is of the ability of the eye to function properly. Okay, in, in the sense of seeing something clearly. Now some of us need glasses. I'm, I'm one of those. <laughs> um, I have difficulty reading sometimes. And, and what happens is if I'm tired or something like that, and uh, there's something I need to read, what I find is, is that, I, that I cannot see it clearly. That's because my eye, physical eye, is not functioning properly. Okay, there's, there's a hindrance there. So I put on my reading glasses. Oh, and now I can, that's what it says. I can actually read it. So that word, lepo in the Greek, refers to the, to the ability of the eye to function properly. Strong's uh, defines this as having the power of sight. Okay, so that's a, that's a physical thing. And that's different from Edo, what Jesus uses in verse 27 of, of Luke 9. The third word, horeo, this means to look attentively at something, to take note, to take a specific note, okay? So when you, uh, perhaps you read something, you go, oh, what does that say again? And, and it is giving that kind of attention to what you're, what you're looking at. Um, the idea of taking care of making sure that you, that you see clearly, that you, that you uh, comprehend it properly. Um, okay. It's also translated in the sense of taking care, and like Matthew 8, verse 4, Jesus said unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Okay, so when it's, Jesus says, See that you tell no man, he's saying, Take care. You know, make sure you don't, you don't tell, no, tell no one what um, you have experienced. Okay, so. And then the last one, the arrow. 
that's to watch, to watch something, to, to sit down essentially and, and, and view something as it occurs. And without the background to the different words in the Greek, we might assume that the word that Jesus uses in uh, verse 27 is, would be that. That he's going to take them up and they're going to, be like three spectators, watch something as it occurs. Right? They won't taste of death until they see the kingdom of God. They, they're, going, they're going to observe it. Well, again, when we look at the Greek, uh, we find that that is not entirely the case. It, they would observe it in that sense, but that was not the purpose. The purpose was for them to come to understand something. Okay. And that word, ido, or ido, is translated as no. K-N-O-W, as many, almost as many times as it is translated C. So that gives us, a, again, just underlining the fact that um, this is why Jesus brought them up, to give them an, a good understanding okay, of, the, of the kingdom of God. So then our next question will be, well, why did they need this understanding? Well, obviously we all need understanding of, of that, certainly. But there's something very specific about this because Jesus does not share this with all 12. He only takes three, okay? He takes those close companions um, and he brings them up and he gives them an experience that was going to help them to understand the kingdom of God in a certain context and he gives them that vision, okay? He makes them to come to know, or come to understand the kingdom of God for a specific purpose. Those three men. And what they were to come to understand about the kingdom of God, what was exhibited to them as they were on the mount was the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus says, this is going to be a picture of the kingdom so that you might understand and within the context of that what he shows them or what is shown to them i should say is christ in glory okay? and there are other elements of it too of course with uh, moses and elijah also being there and the cloud and the voice i mean these are all elements of, of what was expressed to them all right but what they were to take from this was the glory of christ within the context of the kingdom of God. And the reason for this was that what they faced as they uh, spent those three years with him, at the end, of course, they were going to see the terror of his death. That was something that they were going to experience. They would be confronted with that. And this understanding was given to them. Again, the context of the glory of Christ within the kingdom of God was given to them to mitigate the effect that that death would have upon their faith. Because it was necessary for them to play a very central part in what was to occur following his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. So in order to prepare them for not only what they would experience at Golgotha, okay, but also to help prepare them for the work that he was going to give them. Okay? So why Peter, James, and John? Well, they were the pillars of the ecclesia in Jerusalem following his ascension. These three men had, a, had special duties, special responsibilities, and essentially they were the leaders. And where leaders lead, followers follow. So in order for them to be prepared for not only what they were going to experience at Golgotha, but that work which lay beyond that, Okay, in the, in the uh, building up of the ecclesia in the first century, it was necessary for them to have a clear vision of the kingdom of God. 
And within that context, the glory of the Christ. All right, now we got to expand that idea out a little bit uh, when we talk about the glory of the Christ. And we will, we will ask Brother Thomas to do that for us in Eureka. Um, he's commenting on Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, something we talked about in midweek class. Right, Raj? Okay. Um, in Revelation 1, verse 16, there is a description of the one like the Son of Man whose appearance was as the sun shining in his strength. Okay, and, and what is the description of, the, of Christ in the Mount of Transfiguration? Okay, his countenance was changed, right? It, it, it shined forth. Um, it's also what we're looking at in Daniel chapter 10. And again, we have that description in Revelation chapter 1. One like unto the Son of Man. Now, Brother Thomas comments on this verse in Eureka. He says, this, meaning the shining appearance, was typified in the general appearance, appearance of the Alpha on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John were witnesses of this. It was a representation of the power and coming, or majesty, of the Lord Jesus anointed. On that occasion, his face prosopon, that's the Greek word Brother Thomas uses, meaning it shone like the sun, and his raiment became white as the light. Brother Thomas continues, he says, this transfiguration scene exhibited the Son of Man personal and corporate, Okay, so what does he mean by that? Personal would be the person, the Lord Jesus Christ, but corporate, it is one like unto the Son of Man. Okay, expressing the idea of the uniting of the body with the head. Following the judgment, the faithful will again be joined to their head. And so the two... The head, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the body, the faithful, in the ecclesia, ecclesias, okay, being united together, they form the corporate Son of Man. Okay, and so Brother Thomas is saying that this shining is not, is not limited to Christ alone, but to also those who will be joined with him, again, following the judgment, those who are ushered into the kingdom of God. And so that's what we're seeing in this vision here on, uh, on the mount. We're seeing the glory of Christ, but within the context, it is more than just the glory of the personal person, but also the corporate Christ. Okay, and so this becomes then, as we begin to understand these things, this becomes a, truly a vision of comfort and of encouragement because that scene which they saw was not only their Lord being glorified but also the promise that they too would be part of that and this was again to encourage them in the work that they had before them okay so let's continue on what brother Thomas is saying he says this transfiguration scene exhibited the son of man personal and corporate and the glory of the father as he will be in the kingdom of deity his general aspect will be glorious. And says John, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Jesus being the son of righteousness, and they, the saints, like him. He will then shine forth in his power, the sun of an unclouded day, and as he shines, so shall they. Okay, and what... Obviously, what gives us this idea is that the, the uh, one like unto the Son of Man of, of Revelation six, uh, 1 verse 16 is expressive of those who are drawn out of the uh, seven ecclesias, right? Which chapters 2 and 3 go on to, to describe. And in each uh, letter to the ecclesias, Jesus says, to him that overcometh. All right, so within the body of the ecclesia, there are those who will overcome. Those are the ones who are ushered to the right hand of Christ in the day of judgment. And they become corporate of the full filling of 
the vision of the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1, shining in glory, and in Luke chapter 9, again, the vision which these men witnessed, shining in glory, um, Christ himself along with the saints. Okay. And this, I believe, would have been the kind of encouragement that the apostles needed, not only to endure the crucifixion, but for that work that lay beyond. Now, we can ask the question legitimately, would they have understand what they saw on the mount? No. Not at that time. Right? But what did Jesus say concerning their understanding after his ascension? That he would send them the comforter, right? That he would give them the spirit by which they would understand the things which he had spoken and done. So as they are embarking upon this work, through the Spirit, they would understand what they witnessed that day. They would see themselves there. And so be encouraged to persevere in that work. And Brother Roberts in Nazareth Revisited talks about the persevering I have a quote here. He says, To strengthen a man for persevering testimony in a matter in the face of opposition and unfavorable appearances. Now, the persevering testimony, by what Brother, Tom, uh, Brother Roberts is referring to, is the fact that even in the face of such opposition by which the apostles were uh, thrown into prison, uh, were beaten, right? Um, were even killed, in the face of this opposition, that testimony needed to persevere. The testimony needed to continue. It had to go on. It was a persevering testimony in the face of opposition. He continues, the thing necessary to be done is to make him, that is the, the, the one who is testifying, quite certain the thing is true. This is best done by evidence that will implant its own conviction. And the evidence that Brother Roberts is alluding to here is the transfiguration which these men see upon the mount. And again, he only brings the three because they were to play instrumental part in the development of the ecclesia following the Lord's ascension. And as the leaders lead, the followers will follow. So it was very important for these men then to have this vision of glory, which they would not have understood at that time. And we see that in Peter's words. We're, well, next week, hopefully, we'll get to the idea of building the three tabernacles and what it was that Peter actually desired. Because he did not understand what he was being shown. But later on, after they received the spirit of understanding, it would have been made known to them and they would have been encouraged by that. So Jesus is giving them this understanding then of the kingdom of God and, and the glory that they would share as being corporate in his body. He is giving them this uh, for the purpose of encouragement and inspiration. Okay. Now there's something that when we uh, read in about the transfiguration, there's something that we might just kind of perhaps pass over. It's an important detail that's, that's added by Luke, and we find it in verse 28 and in verse 29. And so his intent is to encourage these men. But when we are given the narrative, we are told that he went up into a mountain to pray. And he prayed. And there's several things that we need to take away from this. And one is that there, was, there wasn't anything that was ever done by the Lord that was done without his Father's blessing. He never presumed anything. So if he was, had in his mind to give this, his apostles, his brethren, this encouragement for the work that was to begin, or that was to come after his ascension, he began with a word of prayer. So what would he have sought? He would have sought from his father this vision, right? 
Because that was not done at his hand. But rather, the Father performed this miracle, if you will. And again, to strengthen his brethren. And in response to this prayer, we see the Father adding to the experience as he declares, this is my beloved son, hear him. He doesn't say see him, right? But hear him. And what is, what is hearing within this context? It is to give attention to, right? You give, give attention to this. And there are several things within the context of this that they needed to listen to, that they needed to be attentive to. One is his intention of giving them this vision in the first place. So listen to him, you know, be encouraged by this. Uh, take away from this experience that which would be necessary for you to fulfill the purpose. But there's also something else that I think is, is incredibly important in this context. Okay, and what they needed to understand in relation to uh, the glory of the kingdom of God, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ being in glory and their participation in that, there's something that they needed to understand and they desperately needed to understand it. And it's what we see, again, within the context, going back into Luke, uh, uh, still in Luke 9, verse 23. Jesus says to them, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. So he's alluding to that which these men were about to see. But he says, don't be ashamed of me and my father. When would they have had that opportunity? Well, certainly in their day-to-day -day experiences, but greatly beyond the time of the death, resurrection, and ascension. Okay, they were to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ raised into glory and not to be ashamed of that. So he's counseling them that they needed to crucify themselves, isn't that? That's exactly what he's saying. He says, take up your cross and follow me. Lose your own life that you might gain life. And this is what they had to do in order to fulfill the, the commission that he gave them. In Mark chapter 16, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. That was the commission. And in order to fulfill that, well, one, they couldn't be ashamed of that commission. They couldn't, they couldn't hide that light under a bushel, right? They had, it had to be exposed. And there's a saying in this world that a picture is worth a thousand words. Okay? The picture of Peter, James, and John would be the way in which they lived their lives. That meant so much, no matter what came out of their mouth, and what they spoke was the truth, the gospel, certainly. But they had to live it. And how did they live it? They had to crucify their flesh. How did they crucify their flesh? Through the things which they endured for the name of Jesus Christ. They were willing to suffer these things. Not only, you know, the whippings and the, and the, uh, the imprisonments, but think about, <laughs> Peter was a married man, wasn't he? See, he had to put the work of the gospel first. So he had to put away the things of his own flesh and go forward preaching the gospel of Christ even though he knew it was going to bring him hardship. 
And so Jesus is counseling them. First, he say, he's saying, you need to crucify your flesh if you want to share in my glory. And then he's going to, they're going to be given a vision of this glory. And the father says, listen to my son. Consider what he's saying. If you want to be part of the glory, you must share in the persecution. And they did. They certainly did. They endured persecution to the utmost. So in order to prepare them for that which they were going to uh, experience following his, again, his ascension, the work that he had given them, what they were going to experience, he gives them this vision that they might understand the kingdom of God more fully. All right. I want to spend a little bit of time on the location of the transfiguration. Now, anybody that's studied this knows very well that we are not told in any record that it was this spot. Um, not, not, you know, on the surface, but we certainly uh, have, can decipher what it is and, and the reason for, or where it is. And the reason for this, I think, um, is to understand the next part of the context. So if we go back in, in, in Luke 9, we see he's, he's counseling them to not be ashamed of the gospel, to crucify their flesh so that they may fulfill his commission. He gives them the vision uh, in order to encourage them. And then he talks about faith. So that, that, that faith, that part about faith is the, is the next part of this whole context. Matthew 17, verses 19 and 20. So Jesus has come down from the mount with the three. We know, we're familiar with the, the uh, circumstances, the, the epileptic boy, which the, the others were unable to heal. They came to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? Why could they not heal the epileptic boy? Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now think about the context here. Think about his words of counsel prior to the transfiguration, what they witnessed in the transfiguration, and now he's saying that they need to have a greater faith. It doesn't say that you don't have faith. He's saying you need a greater faith. And of course, the uh, healing that went on uh, during the, uh, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ were also expressive of um, the gospel, right? They went hand in hand with the gospel. Um, those, those miracles were given, um, partly at least, some might say primarily, uh, to legitimize the message that was being said. And we see that in a number of places, right? When, uh, when they were debating about this Jesus of Nazareth, saying, no man can do these miracles except he be sent from God. Okay, so they, they certainly understand it within that context. And then he, he would give them the message of the kingdom. All right. Also, the faith that would help them endure through the difficulty um, of their, their work after his ascension um, was necessary for the miracles that they were going to perform during that work. Um, and, 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 unless that, and if that sounds confusing, Mark 16, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So the faith of the disciples needed to be increased in order to manage what were, they were going to be confronted with, but also to fulfill the mission, that, the commission that Jesus had given them. 
in order to effectively preach that gospel, he was giving them, or would give them, the power to heal the sick. Okay? Now think of the epileptic boy. Here's, one, here's an instance. And of course, Jesus is up on the mount with the three, and the others find that they are unable to cast this demon out. And Jesus essentially says, your faith is not strong enough. But then he says, if you have faith like the mustard seed, and we're all very familiar with that, right? The, the mustard seed being that teeniest of seeds grows into the greatest of herbs. Okay? And that speaks of the potential of faith to grow. Given the proper conditions and the proper tending, faith can grow from that teeny tiny seed into this greatest of herbs. And then Jesus says, you shall say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place. Okay, so the, a, uh, a measuring stick, if you will, of the degree of, the, of their faith would be to say to this mountain, go over there. Go over there. But you notice he doesn't say a mountain. He says this mountain. Now his, his point was very specific. Okay? And it's based in scripture. And he's not just giving them an arbitrary reference to something that would be seemingly so impossible. Can you imagine saying to Mount Washington, go over there and it goes? But he's not saying that. He's not saying a mountain or any mountain. He says this mountain. He doesn't say the mountain either. He says this mountain. And obviously he's referring to the mountain that he, he and the others had just come down from. So can we figure out where the Lord and the disciples were when he said this? What mountain was he referring to? Well, consider the path that we have seen in the last few miracles. After the feeding of the 4,000 in Mark 8, we read in verse 10 that he entered into the area of Dalmanutha. Now Matthew is, is more specific. He says Magdala. Now if you can see on that map, that blue square, okay, that's Magadan. That's the area of Magdala. It's on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. So after feeding the 4,000, this is where Jesus goes, the west coast of the Sea of Galilee, just about halfway down the sea, as you can, as you can see in that map. Where does he go next? Verse 22, we find he heals a blind man in Bethsaida, which is that green box. Okay, and Bethsaida was on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. So he's gone from the halfway down the western shore, he's gone up to the top of the Sea of Galilee, and he heals a blind man in Bethsaida. And next, in verse 27, he enters into Caesarea Philippi, and that would be the yellow box. Okay, much further north. So he essentially has departed from the Sea of Galilee and travels quite a distance up into Caesarea Philippi. And so we can see from this that his path has been on a northward trend. Starting from the Sea of Galilee up to the north of the Sea of Galilee and then up north even further beyond the Sea of Galilee to Caesarea Philippi. Now you can also see in this map, oh you, you may not be able to read it, but I'll tell you what it is, that the red box is Mount Hermon. Okay. I have another map here. Okay, now you see there's three red boxes there. Mount Hermon is the top one. Now the significant thing about Mount, Mount Hermon, and many of you may know this, it is the highest mountain in the whole land of Israel, by far. Mount Tabor, and that would be that box in the middle. Mount Tabor is basically southwest of the Sea of Galilee. Mount Tabor is considered by many and by most to be the Mount of Transfiguration. Even though we've looked at this path where he's, he's traveling northward, uh, the reason that's given is uh, Jesus says, 
about eight days or after six days, right? So they say, well, he left where he was headed and went down to Mount Tabor, uh, and that's where he was transfigured. Um, the thing about Mount Tabor is that it is not a high mountain. It's only 1,800 feet. Okay, so it's a high hill, <laughs> but it's not, it's not a mountain by any stretch. I have a quote here from the Catholic Encyclopedia about why Mount Tabor is chosen. Already in apostolic times, the Mount of Transfiguration had become the, mount, the Holy Mount, 2 Peter 1, verse 18. It seems to have been known by the faithful of the country and tradition, tradition identified it with Mount Tabor. Origen, one of the uh, fathers of the Catholic Church said, Tabor is the mountain of Galilee on which Christ was transfigured. Okay. In the next century, St. Cyril of Jerusalem and St. Jerome likewise de declare that categorically. Later, and this, these names are gonna be hard for me, St. Proculus, Patriarch of Constantinople, Agathangelus, and Arnobius the Younger say the same thing. So what is the basis? Is these church fathers saying Mount Tabor, the mountain of Galilee is where Christ was transfigured. The testimonies increased from century to century without a single dissenting note and in 553 the fifth council of Constantinople erected a sea at Mount Tabor. Finally the ancients judged of the height, excuse me, finally the ancients judged of the height of mountains by their appearance, and Tabor especially was considered a high mountain. By what context, I have no idea. Tabor especially was considered a high mountain, if not by David and Jeremiah, at least by Origen and St. Jerome and the pilgrims who made the ascent. So why is Mount Tabor chosen? It's because the church father said so. Okay? They literally say, well, David and Jeremiah didn't consider it to be a high mountain, but these other fellows did. Therefore, Mount Tabor is the Mount of Transfiguration. The last box in the bottom there, you can probably guess what that is. Anybody want to take a stab at it? Nope. Close. It's another mountain in right, right around the precincts of Jerusalem. What do we call Jerusalem? What's the mountain name for Jerusalem? Zion. Mount Zion. Okay, so that's Mount Zion. Now, Mount Zion is 2,500 feet. Okay, Mount Tabor is 1,800 feet. Mount Hermon is 9,200 feet. Okay, we're familiar with Mount Washington, right? Anybody know how, Mount, how high Mount Washington is? 6,200. Almost 63. That's like the highest point in New England. That's pretty big. If you've ever climbed it, it's like, wow. <laughs> okay. Mount Hermon is half again taller. Mount Tabor is a little hill. But we're told that Jesus took them up into a high mountain. Not a high hill. Now Jesus says that a greatly increased faith will remove this mountain to yonder place. And it's not likely that he was speaking literally, that they're going to make Mount Hermon get up and move somewhere else. That's not what he's talking about. But there is an Old Testament prophecy that shows that the glory of Hermon, now the glory of Hermon is in its height. It is known for its height, okay? It's higher than all the other mountains in Israel. And there's an Old Testament prophecy that tells us that the glory of Hermon will be transferred to another place. Psalm 68, verse 15, the hill of God is as the hill of Bashan, and high hill as the hill of Bashan. So what's the hill of God? We can answer that quite simply, right? It's Psalm 2, verse 6, I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Zion is the hill of God. So in Psalm 68, Zion is as the hill of Bashan, and high hill as the hill of Bashan. So what's the hill of Bashan? Joshua 12, verses 4 and 5, In the coast of Og, king of Bashan, 
which was of the remnant of the giants that dwelt in at Ashtaroth and at Edrai, and reigned in Mount Hermon and in Salca and all Bashan unto the border of the Geshurites and the Maacathites and half Gilead and the border of Sihon, king of Heshbon. But what is the hill of Bashan? It's Hermon. So Psalm 2 verse 6 says, I'm sorry, Psalm 68 verse 15 says, Zion as, is as Hermon and high hill as Hermon. Now, I've already noted that Zion is only 2,500 feet. Hermon is 9,600 feet. That's talking about the, vis the physical. But the glory of Hermon will be transferred to Zion. And in the age to come, Zion will become as high as Hermon. Consider Psalm 48, verse 2. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, on the, hill, on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. So we're probably familiar with this, but the word situation there in the Hebrew means elevation. Beautiful for elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, on the sides of the north. Zion is to be praised for her elevation on the north. If you're familiar with Mount Zion, Zion has no elevation on the north. If you're coming south, you can simply walk straight on up to Mount Zion. Okay? Its elevation comes from the east, west, and the south, where the, where the land drops away. So Zion's elevation at 2,500 feet is from the east, west, and the south. On the north, you can just walk straight out onto it. And yet the prophecy is that Zion will be praised for her northern elevation. Something that simply does not exist. But we know, don't we, that there is great change coming to that area. Because the Mount of Olives is going to split. And a great valley will appear. The Mount of Olives will split north and south to create that way of the kings come from the east. Okay, so when that occurs, the ge geography is going to be greatly changed. And in order to fill the prophecy of, of Psalm 48, Zion is going to be raised up. And the glory of Hermon is going to be transferred to Mount Zion. The hill of God will become as the hill of Bashan. Specifically on the northern side, which right now, has, again, has no elevation. So the glory of Hermon is going to go to another place. And Hermon is about 2,000 miles away from Jerusalem directly north. So when Jesus says you need to increase your faith and you can say to this mountain, go to yonder place, the faith that needs to be increased is in the kingdom of God. The things concerning the kingdom of God, the gospel message, right? And those things concerning the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So within this context then, we see the encouragement for the apostles. Take up your cross and follow me. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. Here is the vision of glory. Now increase your faith. And you will say to this mountain, Hermon, go to yonder place, Mount Zion. But what does that mean? It doesn't mean the literal picking up of the mountain. It's praying for the kingdom of God. It's praying for the things which they have witnessed on Mount Hermon. They have gone up that mountain 9,200 feet with the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe not to the top. We, we can't be dogmatic about that. But they have gone up this mountain and Jesus says, you're going to say to this mountain, go to yonder place. If you have faith, and we need to understand that the things which we should be praying for are the things that are of the will and purpose of our, of our God. And we, don't, we shouldn't pray for things to, to uh, you know, 
consume them of our own flesh. Right? But thy will be done. These are the things that we should be praying for. And Jesus says, if you have faith in that which you have witnessed, you are not ashamed of the gospel, then you, you will see this come to pass. This is what you should be praying for, this mountain. So I think it's pretty clear, not only from just the record of where Jesus was likely to have been at that time, okay, moving northward, and I think that he's literally bringing his apostles that way. Okay, it's not like he found himself in the area. You know, I went to Caesar or Philip, I, well, here's a high mountain, let's do this. He's bringing them there. So that they might come to know, come to understand the glory of Christ within the context of the kingdom. And this is what they are to pray for. This is to be their inspiration, their encouragement, so that they can fulfill their commission. And we've gone over. So. Only by five minutes. I normally go 15 over. but <laughs> So next week, we're going, to, we're going to start with, was this real? Or was it just simple, simply a vision that they saw in their minds? We'll start there.